Okay, so here is the next part of the wrestling tutorial. Make sure to check out the description of the video if you're interested in seeing the whole playlist of this tutorial. And um, let's get started right away. Gonna run uh, wrestling swatch. This is gonna compile all of the existing exercises. Cool. And here we have our next compilation error. And the compiler complains that in move semantics 1.rs, it cannot borrow vec1 as mutable as it is not declared as mutable. And then we can see that there's vec1 here in line 9, and we apparently try to push something into it in line 13. So um, let's let's take a look at that. I'm gonna open up exercises, move semantics, move semantics 1. All right, okay, so here we can see we have a vector, which is, for those who don't know, a vector is really just a list of values just like an array, but it can grow in size. If you're coming from other languages like, like JavaScript, uh, you're just used to using arrays anyways, and these can grow in size. That's no big deal. In Rust, it's a little bit different. You can either have kind of like static list or collections of values that don't actually grow in size, and then you can have vectors which explicitly are made for the scenarios where you want to add or remove values at, at runtime. So here we're creating a new vector, and then we call a function fill vec on it and pass down this, this vector that we've created before. It looks like it's returning a vector as well. So let's take a look here, fill vec. Yeah, so it takes a vector of i32. So you see there's usage of a generic type and it returns a vector of i32. So it's a list of numbers essentially. And what it does is it introduces a new variable vec, which is mutable and then pushes some values into it and it returns that mutable vector. We call this function here and we get essentially a new vector back. And then next up, we're basically outputting the, the length of the vector and the values of it. Then we push another value into it and then we output the same thing again. So once this is compiling, we should see uh, two, two lists of, of values um, of different size as well. Now the compiler was complaining that it cannot actually push something into this vector because it's not mutable. And I guess the the point here is that this vector is in fact declared as mutable inside of this function. This is why we can push new values into it in the first place. However, as soon as this function returns this vector, it's actually gonna move ownership of that particular value to you know whoever is, is receiving that value. In this case, it's the variable vec2, uh, which is not declared as mutable. So while it's created as a mutable value, we move the value to a variable that is immutable and that causes the compiler to complain here that we're trying to alter the state of this vector while it is an immutable thing. So in other words, once we make this variable mutable, it should compile. And here we see it's compiling, it outputs vec1 has length 3 with this content, and here we see it has length 4 with this content. Okay, that's great. If you're new to Rust, then this might not be super clear here, what it exactly means that we're moving value from one variable or function to another. This is the concept of ownership in Rust, and we will explore this more in, in another video in, in more detail. I've also written an article about it, which you can find in the description below. For now, let's just take it as it is and accept that even though we have a value and variable created inside of this function that is declared mutable, it's not going to be automatically mutable on the caller side. Okay, so let's remove this comment here and move on to the next exercise. All right, so in move semantics 2, we have another compilation error that says a borrow of moved value vec0. And then a compiler says that in line 8, the variable vec0 is being moved because it has the type vec i32, which does not implement the copy trait. And then it says in line 10, the value is being moved here. Essentially, the compiler is saying, look, you've created this value and you're, you're moving it around. You're passing ownership of that value 
from one thing to another. And after you've done that, you're still trying to borrow it for another thing that used to have ownership, but it doesn't have it anymore. Let's take a look at the file to get a better understanding of what that means. So I'm gonna open up Move Semantics 2. Okay, so here we can see that this file has pretty much exactly the same contents as the one of the previous exercise. Um, we have our vector here that's being created and we have our fillback function, which is doing the same changes to our vector as before. And then after we have created this other vector from our first vector, we're still printing the, the values as before. Now, the reason the compiler is complaining here is because the moment we create this vector here, vec0 is gaining ownership of that particular value. So it is the only variable in this program, in this very moment, that points to that data. Now, when we pass that variable to fill vec, we're essentially moving ownership to that function here. And then as before, we're creating this variable vec, which then takes ownership. Again, values are being pushed into that vector and we return the vector and then vec1 gets ownership of that value. In other words, the moment we pass vec0 to this function, it no longer has ownership of this data, but we're still trying to read something, in this case, the length from that value that we're expecting in that variable. And, and this is the problem here. So Rust comes with this concept of, of dropping values. And when you pass ownership of a value to a function, once the function is done, it will drop the value from memory. This is essentially what you would otherwise have to do manually in other languages, what you call destructors and things like that. So Rust gives you kind of the same thing in a, in a semi-automated fashion, if you will. It takes care of dropping values for you, but this also means that you have to take care of moving or returning ownership the way you, you need it. Okay, so now that we know why the compiler is complaining, let's take a look at a hint here. Okay, so the exercise says that vec0 is being moved into the function fillback. Yeah, we know that now, which means it gets dropped at the end of fillback. Yes, that's what I just referred to, which means we can't use vec0 again on line 13 or anywhere else in that main function after that fillback call for that matter. We could fix this in a few ways. Try them all. So the first thing we can do to fix this is we make another separate version of the data that's in vec0 and pass that to fill vec instead. What that means is essentially we would copy the data and then pass that down so that vec0 would not actually lose ownership of that. The second thing we can do is we can make fill vec borrow its argument instead of taking ownership of it and then copy the data within the function in order to return an owned vec of i32. And the third thing we can do is we can make fill vec mutably borrow its argument, which will need to be mutable, modify it directly, then not return anything. Okay, so let's do all of these one step at a time. We start with the first one. We make another separate version of the data. So I'm gonna go back here and I say, we have a, let's say, a let vec copy, and that is a vec zero dot to vec. And then we can go ahead and pass that vector copy here instead of vec zero, which means that vector zero still has ownership of its own value and we could still access it in this print line function here. So if I save this and go back. All right, I then obviously need to add a semicolon. Sorry for that. And then this is compiling. Obviously, this also means that the first vector that we're outputting has no values in it at all because we're passing an empty vector to the function. Okay, so I'm gonna open up the hint again and then we do the second one. We can make fillback borrow its argument instead of taking ownership of it, and then copy the data within the function. In other words, what we would need to do is we would change this again and we say, okay, fill vec, instead of taking a vec of i32, we say it takes a reference to a vec of i32. And then in here, we would say our vec variable is a vector to vector, which then is going to create an actual copy of that, which will be returned in this function. And then when we say we're expecting a reference here, we also need to pass vec0 as a reference. We do that with the ampersand symbol, the same way we declared the reference here in the method signature. And that should do the trick. So let's save that. Wonderful. This is compiling with exactly the same output. Our vec0 has no content at all. And last but not least, we want to do version three. We make fill vector mutably borrow its argument. Okay. 
So again, as I said earlier, we would change this method signature to say that the expected vector is a reference to a mutable reference to a vector of i32. And then we can just work with that vector here. We don't have to return anything because we're mutating the, the reference that we get in place. I'm going to remove the vec here. And then I'm going to remove the return value here because we're no longer returning anything, which also means we can get rid of vec1 here. And then we also need to get rid of this line. So there's no longer a vector1. Saving this. Actually, before I go back to the compiler output, I already saw there's a little issue here. When we say that this function expects a mutable reference, we also need to pass the reference as a mutable reference. And that, in turn, requires us to make this variable mutable as well. So let's save this. And wonderful. This is compiling. And we see that VEC0 has a length of 3. Cool, so now we have done all of the three variations to solve this exercise. I'm gonna remove this comment and move on to the next one. All right, there's a bit more going on here. Let's scroll up a little bit. Okay, so in move semantics three, there are several mutable borrows here that are not allowed. So uh, let me just ask for a hint before we open up the file. So the difference between this one and the previous ones is that the first line of fill vector that had the let mutable vec equals vec is no longer there. You can, instead of adding that line back, add mute in one place that will change an existing binding to be a mutable binding instead of an immutable one. So let's open up move semantics number three. All right, so here we have our fill vec function, which no longer has the variable initialization. The hint set that we just need to put a mutable keyword somewhere here to make this program compile. I guess one thing we can do here is saying that this function takes a mutable vector, which is then going to change that very vector here and return it. And then this is going to have ownership here in vec1 which also means obviously that the moment we pass vec0 to this function, it's still gonna lose ownership of the value, but that doesn't seem to be an issue here because this print line no longer actually asks for vec0, it actually asks for vec1. Passing vec0 just as a mutable vector should do the trick. This also means that we need to make the vec0 variable mutable as well. Let's make this mutable and save the file. And wonderful, this is compiling, cool. I'm going to remove this comment as always and move on to the next one. Let me scroll up a little bit here. All right, and move semantics four. Compiler complains about a bunch of things. Oh, there's even an expected zero arguments error here. Oh, and here it says that the function is defined there and it indeed doesn't ask for an argument. So let, let's just ask for a hint really quick. Okay, stop reading whenever you feel like you have enough direction. The end goal is to get rid of the first line in main that creates the new vector. So then vec0 doesn't exist, so we can't pass it to the fill vec function. It just said I should stop if I feel like I have enough directions. So before I move on reading this out loud, I'm going to open up the file and take a look. Okay, again, same file contents as before. And it here it says, indeed, that fill vector no longer takes a vector. And the goal is to get rid of vec0. So let me just remove this now. And here we also see that print line still asks for vec1. Okay, so I'm going to remove that. That means we don't need to pass vec0 here. And then we need to see that probably that the vector that is created inside of this fill vector function, well, it actually has to be created. It's no longer coming from anywhere. So maybe we just need to do a vec new and then save it. Huh. That was it. Let me just finish reading the hint really quick. Okay, since we're not creating a new vec in main anymore, we need to create a new vec in fill vec, similar to the way we did in main. Oh, well, that's pretty much what I just did. So I guess that worked. Wonderful. Okay, removing that comment and moving on to the next one. And that's it with all of the exercises about move semantics. I think this was a little bit more sophisticated and special. I'm certainly going to create more videos about ownership in Rust and borrowing specifically. So um, make sure to subscribe and thanks for watching.